The car is now drivable again. I really want to turn it into a daily driver as I work on it, but there are still a few things that need to get ready for that. So this episode, I want to get crucial stuff taken care of and take the car home from the garage to have some fun with it. I've been able to drive the car around the block a bit, and one of the tires has had the paint start to peel off already. The R3 have little spots peeled up, but are pretty much fine. I looked into what I did wrong because I know this is a thing people actually do, and it's because I didn't clean the tires properly beforehand. I just used some dish soap, but you really want to use some degreaser and a bit of alcohol and really rub it out. It's really not that bad and you only notice it close up, but I think as it peels off more, I'll just redo them at some point later. Of all things, it's a pretty easy thing to redo, so no big deal. I also have an appointment scheduled at my friend's shop back home where my parents live. He's gonna get my muffler and exhaust situation figured out and welded. Again, the main thing is my new exhaust pipe I bought is from an older MR2 and doesn't have an O2 port on it, so he's gonna weld a new one on. My dad is gonna drive the MR2 to the shop for me. I also got the muffler hangers in the mail. Cost me $60, but I mean, I need them and mine was missing them. They just bolt to the underside of the car where the muffler goes. I was also missing the bolts, but after some trial and error, I found they are the same size as the ones that hold the seat in place. So I just went to the store and bought some spares of those to use. Now that the car is being driven, I also have to put all the plastic light covers back on. I took them off way back when I first got the car to remove the Plasti Dip overspray on them. Now that the car can move outside, I also really have to clean up my frunk. When my brake master cylinder went out, it leaked fluid all over and made a huge mess, but I also noticed there's just literal dirt in there too, so all you have to do is remove the plastic plugs and then you can rinse it out. Uh, you can see I already popped the left one off there. Nothing much to it, just rinse it out really well and then try to wipe up any extra stuff, that way you don't have just sitting liquid in there. Another thing while the car is out is I want to get the Plasti Dip off now that I can use a hose. I brought some garbage bags for the wheels so I don't get stuff on them, but obviously you can see they weren't quite big enough. The Goo Gone definitely works at breaking it up, but actually getting the stuff all off is the hard part. The hose does get a good amount of it off, but isn't quite strong enough to get it all off but I still tried to get both sides and a bit of the hood while I was at it. It just isn't quite working as well as I hoped. All right, I'm gonna call it good for now. I made only a little progress, but as you can see, the hose is leaking and there are puddles everywhere, so I'm soaked now. Plus the plastic dip is just making a huge mess everywhere on the ground. So my plan is to take the car to a self-serve car wash and finish the job another time. Hopefully the pressure washers they have is strong enough to finally just spray it all off. All right, it's been maybe a week or so. My dad took the car to the shop to get the exhaust taken care of. Their estimate was originally three to $500, which honestly at first sounded a bit high, but they were gonna order a new O2 sensor, which is like $100. And of course they need the flange for it too. I planned on replacing the sensor later anyways, but they are right, it makes sense just to do it now. When the job was done, my friend's boss called and the final cost was $600, which was even more over what I expected. I mean, that's my month's rent right there. Uh, not gonna lie, they did do good work and clean the muffler of rust and gunk a bit too, but dang, I can't deny that was an expensive job. I was pretty stressed that now I wouldn't have any money to do anything else for a while on the car, but my dad stepped in and paid it for my Christmas gift, so dang. Huge thanks to him, I'd say that's definitely better than a PS5. Anyways, you can see the new O2 sensor on there. Despite the cost, I mean, I had to get this thing done and shop work is expensive in general, so I'm not blaming them at all to be clear. Uh, it is a custom job and it's not like you can just buy a new exhaust pipe for this car, but still, I am glad to finally have this taken care of and the car sounds great. Not too quiet, but not too loud. When I replaced my stereo, I also realized my speakers were blown out, so I ordered new ones. I originally was gonna order some generic ones off Amazon for like 20 bucks, but I decided to look on eBay and see if anyone was selling any MR2 speakers since they have a more unique two-prong mount and then maybe I wouldn't have to cut anything to make it fit. 
Well, I found these parted out from an MR2 for 35 bucks. I put a watch on them because it was a bit high, but the seller actually reached out and offered $10 off, so I bought them. I mean, they're probably better sounding than any generic ones I was gonna buy too. Well, after that, the seller sent me a message and said, thanks for the purchase. By the way, are you Josh from YouTube? Never did I ever expect to be recognized by just name on eBay, but dang, thanks to Lorenzo for the deal. Anyways, you can see the speakers are the same size, but the mounts are slightly smaller, but they were from an MR2, so they should fit fine. The main difference using aftermarket speakers is the connections are normal speaker ones versus a simple snap-on plug. Luckily, I had some old speaker stuff in the back and could just use these wires. All I gotta do is cut them, strip the ends, and crimp them. Then on the car, I basically do the same thing, just cut, strip, and crimp my new wires to the ones on the car. It's usually best to solder wires, but it's just speakers, so it'll be fine. The main thing is to pay attention to which wire is positive and which is negative. To do this, uh, I just lined up the old plug on the old speaker, and there's a plus mark on the speaker saying which is positive. Now I'm gonna just plug the speakers in and mount it in with the screws. It's a bit of a stretch, but it does in fact fit. The passenger side is the same, but I gotta actually remove the speaker still. It's actually a lot easier to do this side because there's just less stuff in the way. Okay, I just tested it and the driver side speaker sounded blown. I was really confused at first, but it seems I just tightened it down a little too much. So I guess it was rubbing on something when it played. Anyways, it works fine now. Now I can finally listen to music while I drive, an important feature for any car. I took the car for a bit of a spin and now before I call it a night, I'm gonna just leave some old drywall under the engine to check for oil leaks while I'm gone. Normally you just do this with cardboard, but we had a ton of this stuff in our dumpster, so it'll do. It's been a week now. Shockingly, there are almost no leaks. I'm really surprised, but happy to see that. Thankfully, because my dad paid for the expensive exhaust work, I was able to order some parts to get the car ready for daily driving. All of this stuff is from Twos R Us, and of course, all you patrons and Venmo donors out there helped make this happen too. First off, I got a new windshield wiper knob. The old one was just terrible and would rotate like crazy and only sometimes actually work. Uh, you can see this new one actually just works. Thanks to Eric for the donation getting me this. Uh, I'll think of you every time I wipe my windshield now. Here you can see the backside of the old one. It was all cracked, which caused it to spin loose. It's worth noting the intermittent setting doesn't actually work still, but I've read that you can fix that with some solder, so I'll do it later. Another quick note, if you get one of these, uh, the new one didn't fit at first. What I had to do was remove the metal piece from my old knob and replace the metal piece in the new one. Uh, I guess they are slightly different in sizes and it can make it hard to slide on. I also bought new windshield wipers. It's a simple screw on, screw off though. One of the wiper arms was really hard to screw back into, so I just used some WD-40 to get it working again. I also bought some new pedals. They're a bit dusty, probably from shipping or whatever. I already took an old one off and you can see it's just falling apart. I do wanna keep the old pedals though and use them for a test. I'm thinking it could be cool to paint the diagonal lines white to add some extra flair, but I need to see how it looks first, and the old ones are a good way to test that. Larry and Matouche, you each got me one of these pedals, so you can fight it out who wants to be clutch and who wants to be the brake. And the last thing is Dylan, your donation got me these T-top guides. Now I'll explain how these things work. So one big problem my car has is the T-tops leak, which is really bad since I live in Washington. Uh, the T-tops lock into the car through these guide holes. You can just pop them out easily. There is one in the front and one on the back for each side. Here you can see the one on the right is original off the car, and the one on the left is a new replacement. You'll notice the new one actually has the hole off-centered, which is to help pull the T-top in tighter to the seals and hopefully stop any leaks. Okay, I just pull off the four guides from the car, and weirdly enough, one of them is already the new style replacement. You can see it on the top left. Even weirder is looking back at the footage, it looks like it was installed backwards, making the driver's side T-top actually looser. 
Honestly, I have no idea why only one of them is the new kind, let alone why it was installed backwards. You can't even order just one of these things, they come in pairs. But man, what the actual heck is wrong with the last owner of this car? Stuff like this makes me a little worried and concerned if they tried to do any terrible mechanical work themselves or not. But anyways, also while removing these, I noticed I should probably buy some new trim pieces. 2's RS does sell reproduction ones, but I'll hold off on it for now. They are more cosmetic than anything and don't really help with leaks. Uh, I will do it later, but not crucial right now. To install these properly, you want to have the hole closest to the inside of the car and down. So for the driver's side front one, it should look like this when you face it. Again, double check it to make sure it'll be pulling the T-top lock tighter than just pop it in. Same goes for the back and passenger side ones, but just make sure it's oriented the right way. I also ordered these T-top bumpers. They just go on the ends of the T-tops and you can see I'm missing mine. I'm pretty certain they don't actually prevent leaks but are just cosmetic. That being said, it looks like you need glue to install them, so I'll have to do it another time. Lastly, for the T-top leaks, I also bought some weather strip grease. You just rub it on the seals and it'll help revive them since they get dried out over the years. This combined with the T-top guides are the best first options for fixing leaks because they are pretty easy to do and relatively cheap, about $30 for everything. If these don't work though, then you gotta shell out close to $300 for new weather stripping, which is also much harder to install. Uh, I got a few other things I wanna do first, so I'll do the grease later in the video. Just looking at the T-tops, honestly makes me kind of mad. The last owner tried some crappy fixes like putting this foam on the seal. It just looks terrible and it clearly didn't work. I hope I can find a way to peel it off without damaging the actual seal itself since the rubber on the T-top itself is the one seal you can't replace. Seriously, just what is all this garbage glued on here? I feel like this honestly made the leak worse if anything. Alright, I've had enough embarrassment. My car has been missing the engine lid prop, so I've been using a piece of wood. Now it's time to jump into the future and install this hydraulic prop. First thing to do is just unscrew the top lid bolt. Then you take the mount piece that doesn't already have a bolt in it and just bolt it on here. Then you take the mount that does have a bolt on it and stick the bolt through where the original engine lid prop goes and then just tighten the nut to hold the mount in place. Super easy. It does say to really tighten it hard enough so it doesn't come loose from the strut. Then you just pop on the strut and there you go, living in the future. Also, my dad has been drilling out the headlight bulb screws since they were rusted and stripped. I tried to replace the headlights when I first got this car because uh, the last owner actually gave me new bulbs since one light was out, but it soon became clear the reason he didn't replace them was because the screws were stuck. But finally getting that taken care of since I want to drive the car now. That connection is pretty darn dirty, may clean it up a bit. More importantly, you can see the headlight adjustment screws are really rusty. These tend to get rusted because they are exposed to rain, but I don't think buying new ones is the easiest thing, so I'm gonna just soak them in rust remover and hopefully they'll be fine enough. Uh, there are two for each headlight. Though the other headlight is not actually dead, I wanna replace it while I'm at it. Again, I need to buy all new screws for the headlight mounts and also clean up the adjustment screws on this side too. Very spooky looking without the headlights. The last thing I ordered is a new thermostat. As I mentioned last video, my car doesn't warm up at all and just stays in the cold area. This isn't good because the engine is designed to run at operating temperature and the oil needs to warm up to flow properly too. The thermostat controls the cooling system and my guess is my current one is either stuck open, old, or the wrong kind and opening too soon. I've read a lot that you really just want to get an OEM Toyota thermostat because it has to open and close at specific temperatures. I also want to flush and change my coolant, so logically I'm going to just do these two things at the same time. The MR2 uses a crazy amount of coolant since it has to run it from the front radiator to the back engine. I also bought plenty of distilled water to flush the system a couple times and clean everything out. You may need to do a flush depending how dirty your coolant is. 
So now it's time to jack the car up again. You wanna make sure to jack it up so that it's level when you do this. All right, we're at the front of the car on the passenger side. If you look down at the bottom of the radiator, there is the drain plug here. Uh, you unscrew this thing and everyone I've seen do this, the coolant just shoots out and makes a huge mess. But if you look, it looks like mine actually has this little hose here. So I'm guessing when I unscrew it, the coolant will flow out this instead, but Again, I'm still expecting to make a big mess, but I guess we'll see. It'd be nice if it does flow out there instead. I'm gonna get under the car with a funnel just in case and unscrew the plug. Shockingly, the hose worked and didn't make a massive mess. Sweet. You have to get on top of the radiator for later, but on my car, the little cover is held in place with these plastic screws that don't actually unscrew at all, so I'm gonna just have to pry the cover off carefully and deal with that another time. Honestly, after draining it, the coolant looks way cleaner than I expected. With how badly this car has been taken care of in its past, I am very impressed the coolant is clean. Usually that goes unchanged, especially on MR2s and how complicated the refill process is. Uh, I still obviously wanna change it to be up to date on maintenance, but I may not have to do a flush after all. Okay, I just spent about 15 minutes under the car looking for the coolant drain plug on the engine block and I just could not find it for the life of me. I looked online and on mine it seems to be covered by what I think is the air conditioner. So what I'm gonna do is just lift the back end higher and hope that coolant flows towards the front more when I drain the middle plugs. So in that case, the next step is to drain the two middle plugs. You have to remove the underside panels to get to them, and I wasn't sure if it was gonna be on the front or back panel. After a missed guess, it was indeed the front panel. Here we are by the front passenger side wheel. If you look under, you can see the two drain plugs, one right there, and the other is off to the right over there. Got the first one, no problem. You can see I only made a small little mess, but not too bad. Almost time to do the other plug. Okay, well, I drained the second plug with no problem, but when I went to tighten the bolt back on, I snapped the head off, so bad news is I will have to drill that out at some point later when I change the coolant again, but good news is it's in there pretty tight, so I can just leave it for now. Obviously, I over tightened it, but I swear it didn't even feel that tight, then next thing you know it snapped. Honestly, if you're doing this, just buy new ones of these and save the headache before putting them back in. I've also decided, you know, the coolant is pretty clean as is and now I can't even drain the middle plug again, so I'm just gonna say screw it and not do a flush and instead just do a standard refill. I think it will be fine. Again, I wanna replace my thermostat too. You can find the thermostat housing in the engine bay by looking for this plastic bleed valve. Only thing is here you can see the grip for the valve has just cracked straight off. I didn't even do it, I just found the piece lying around in there, so that's gonna be annoying to twist open. I removed the battery to get more room. Uh, now you can see the thermostat housing a little better now. What you gotta do is move the hose clamp out of the way, and then there are two bolts to take apart the housing. Uh, definitely pretty corroded in there though, so I really hope nothing snaps. Uh, otherwise, we are talking some major problems. I think I'm gonna deal with this another day since it is getting late and I'm starting to get a bit hungry. Also, I found this loose connection by the battery. I'm assuming it's nothing that important, but does anyone know what it is? I came back to the garage after a couple days and it looks like the MR2 got moved. It's more crammed over there, so I won't be able to get the best angle working on it right now. All right, just a reminder, I gotta move that hose clamp and then take out these two bolts, uh, one on top and one on bottom. Moving the hose clamp is easy. As far as I know, you don't necessarily have to remove the hose, but the clamp just gets in the way. Doing the bolts does take forever though. You can't fit a socket wrench in there, so you have to just use a normal wrench and can really only turn it a few degrees at a time. The bottom side is much harder than the top and I do think removing the hose would probably make it easier, but these hoses can be pretty tricky to get on and off, so I'm just gonna deal with it. You can see I got it pretty much almost off. The two pieces have been broken apart and are leaking coolant now. Uh, not much I can do about that, but just put something to catch it under the car. 
Now I got it completely open and you can see the thermostat in there. Just make note of which way it goes in. Here I got the new thermostat on the right and the old one on the left. I'm not an expert on these things, but the old one doesn't look like it's stuck open like I guessed and it does indeed say Toyota on it and have the same temperature markings. So it is a legit one. That being said, it definitely is old looking. So hopefully replacing it will actually solve my problem. I also bought a new gasket for the thermostat as well, just in case that's what's wrong with it too. It just wraps around the thermostat. The thermostat is in and the housing is back together, so now I'm gonna put the battery back cause I'll need to start the car in a bit. Now refilling and bleeding the coolant system on this car is a bit of a process, but it's not that hard to do. First you gotta look at the radiator and unscrew this bleed valve three turns. Now on the heater pipes, also in the front up against the firewall, you need to unscrew this bleeder valve three turns. You probably need to move some of this stuff out of the way though. Then you need to get two clear hoses. These actually come with the car and can be found in the front by the heater pipes. Uh, mine are a bit old and stiff, but will be fine. On the two valves mentioned, you just hook the hoses to them and hang them high up. Uh, they need to be higher than the filler cap in the engine bay, and again, also make sure the car is level. Now the last bleed valve is on the thermostat housing. Again, my handle for it is snapped, so I had to use some pliers and slowly turn it loose three turns. There's also usually a hose connected to it, but I just took it off because it's easier to see when coolant comes out if you just put a paper towel in there. Now with all three valves open, you gotta find this filler cap on the passenger side, and from there, just fill it with coolant until coolant starts to come out of the engine bleed valve. Uh, pour slowly or else you'll have coolant overflowing the filler like I did. Once coolant comes out of the engine bleed valve, just tighten it up and continue filling until the hoses in the front fill with coolant and are level with the filler cap uh, you're pouring into. Once that happens, close those two valves. Then, turn the filler cap to its first stop, not the second. Finally, fill the coolant overflow tank to full. You'll notice mine is missing the cap, but it's whatever. I need to buy a new one later. Uh, you also probably want to dump the coolant in here if you're doing a flush. Now you can start the car and let it idle for three minutes. After that, you turn the car off and just look in the filler and see if the coolant dropped. If it did, then you open the front valves again and fill until they rise to level again. Uh, then start the car and repeat until there is no drop in coolant. It looks like mine is fine on the first try, which I'm surprised about, but I guess I didn't fully drain the engine block anyway, so I guess it kind of makes sense. Uh, if you are flushing your coolant system, uh, you actually have to then drain everything out and start the whole thing all over again. Uh, but like I said, I'm not doing that. I've let the car run a few minutes and you can see the car is now finally warming up, so I'm relieved to see the thermostat fix the problem. My camera embarrassingly died after I did the coolant. Uh, all I did though afterwards was move the car closer to the entrance and install the headlights. Uh, doing the headlights is super easy and straightforward, just a few screws that hold it in place. I still need to aim them correctly, so I'll show you that when I get to it. It's now the day after Christmas and I'm here with my girlfriend to finally bring the MR2 home with me. I live an hour and a half away from my dad's garage and I think it's finally ready to make the trip. I was extremely close to coming yesterday on Christmas day, but you know, uh, family obligations and all that, but I really wanted to. Though the car has lots more work it needs, the last real urgent thing I need to do before I can start daily driving it for a bit is to fix the T-top leaks. Earlier, I already did new guide holes, which should hopefully help, but the next step is to use some of this grease that should help the rubber seals since they dry up and shrink as they get old. I couldn't find any definitive instructions for this stuff, so I'm just going off what I could gather. The first thing is to clean the seals, so I'm just taking an old damp rag to it and wiping really good, really sure to get into all the spots. Then of course, I gotta do it to the other side and the T-tops themselves. Man, it's just crazy how dirty they were. The shirt looks like it's tie-dyed black now from all the dirt that was built up in there. Uh, I really just kept wiping forever because it kept pulling more and more stuff after each pass-through. I wouldn't be surprised if this cleaning alone solved the leak. 
I gave the seals one more wipe to dry them and now it's time to actually do the grease. I'm just gonna put some on my finger and rub it in deeply. Again, just be sure to get everywhere and even a bit under the seals too. Again, don't forget the T-tops themselves. It's kind of hard on mine since I still haven't removed all the junk foam the last owner put on here, but whatever. I'm gonna let that sit for like 30 minutes to really set in and go make some pizza rolls then come back. The last thing is I hear you wanna wipe off the excess. I'm just using a new dry rag. This is just so you don't have any extra grease sitting around and causing dirt to get stuck and build up or create a greasy mess anytime you touch them. I don't really have any way to know if it worked until it starts raining, but it definitely all looks nicer and shinier. Time to pull the MR2 out of the garage. You can see there seems to be a bit of an exhaust leak just after the cat. Not a big deal. I do need to replace my cat in the near future. Uh, my assumption is the shop thought the old gasket looked fine when it was actually worn or it's a slightly wrong size, but it could be something isn't quite tight enough to. Oh, Celica, you have served me well for the past year and a half, but for now, it is time to garage you. I'll drive it again whenever I have to do bigger repairs on the MR2, but for now, it is goodbye. It's also worth noting, I live in an apartment in Bellingham, so I don't have any sort of garage to work on the car. Anytime I do stuff, I gotta bring it back here. Got the MR2 all loaded up, and it's time for us to make the trip home. As someone who has driven countless old cars, all I gotta say is, I hope we make it. We did, in fact, survive. Uh, it's the next day now, and I took the car for a little rainy day drive to check the leaks. It didn't rain that hard, but you can still see no leaks. The seat itself is dry, even on the passenger side here. The only leak uh, seems to be coming from the door or something. I'll try some grease on that next, but honestly, that isn't even bad at all. Overall, I'm really impressed with everything as it used to just constantly drip water before this. This is about how hard it was raining when I first noticed the leaks, so there is improvement, but obviously we'll have to see how it holds up under heavier rain. One thing I did notice too though while driving is there's a little bit of water coming from the back side of the window. You can see there's a slight gap between the rubber and the window. I'll try to grease it next too, but I think it's more of an issue with how the window is lined up or something. Still, it doesn't really leak much to be an issue. It's more you just get a little bit of wind noise sometimes, which can be annoying on the freeway. Still, leak-wise, I'm shocked I actually seem to have fixed it, but again, we'll see when it rains harder though. Well, I was originally going to end the episode here, but the very next day, on my way to the garage to do some work for my dad, the clutch pedal was basically toast. It had always grabbed very low to the ground, but on my drive over here, it became nearly impossible to shift. I had to drive about 20 miles on the highway into town just in third gear and managed to pull the car behind our garage. I already planned on adjusting the pedal, but now I literally have to do it and I gotta fix it out here. We inspected the clutch cylinders to see if a bleed was in need, but there didn't appear to be any leaks and the response of the slave cylinder seemed fine. So. I don't think it's that, um, my guess is the pedal free play adjustment is just really off and has been getting worse over time. To adjust the clutch pedal, you gotta first get access to it by taking off the underside dash trim. It's just a few bolts, but you also have to remove the ones that connect to the hood release latch. You need a ruler or tape measure to check the specs, but unfortunately, of course, we only have one with inches here, so this will be an extra pain. One thing to check while you do this is the actual pedal height. It should be between around like six and six and a half inches, which mine is under six inches. So I'm gonna adjust this first too, but I'll check it again after I adjust the free play too, just in case it changes. Looking at it now, you also wanna remove this air duct out of the way. It's literally just one single screw, then it pops out. Now working under the dash is a total pain in the butt. I've done it a lot before on my Fiat Spider, and it's extremely crammed and dark, so I'm gonna try my best to show you what I'm talking about as I work, but you'll just have to bear with me. Anyways, to adjust the height, at the top of the pedal, if you look up there, there's this lock nut on the front side. Uh, you have to first loosen this, then you can just hand turn this thing to raise and lower the pedal. Here I got it loose now, and you can see how easy it is to actually turn. 
Uh, now if you watch, you can see it also work in action. Pretty simple. Now adjusting the pedal free play, this is going to adjust where the clutch actually grabs, which for me, I want to raise it. Doing this is a bit harder. You can kind of see on the back of the pedal there, that push rod. You basically have to do the same thing where you loosen a lock nut, then you turn the rod to adjust the free play. Okay, I just got the lock nut free. It was pretty tight and a bit of a pain. The way you do it is you use a 14 millimeter wrench to hold the black part in place. Then you use another wrench to loosen the nut itself. The key is to remember you actually turn the nut clockwise because you technically are moving it back, not loosening it like you would think. Anyways, you can see I got the lock nut free, but it was pretty stuck. Now, you should just be able to easily spin the rod, but I simply can't. It appears the threads for it are frozen, so I'm gonna grab some pliers or a vice grip and give that a try, because uh, I just cannot get it to budge. Well, I've been at it for like 20 minutes now, still no luck. Not even my dad, the legend himself, could do it. Uh, you can see I even tried to just take off the rod completely so I could soak it and try to loosen it, you know, not crammed under the dash, but it seems to be connected to something on the other side and doesn't just slide out. Honestly, I'm pretty out of ideas and I got other stuff to do today, so I guess I'm just gonna have to leave it for now. My only ideas left are to lay some paper towels underneath and spray a ton of WD-40 and Hope that just loosens things up next time. Um, next time, I may also just put it back together and try to clutch bleed the system and hope that was really the actual problem this whole time, but again, I don't quite think it is. It was a very fun two days while it lasted, but it just kind of sucks. I mean, now the car is stuck outside because I can't just drive it up the ramp into the garage. It's literally in the mud right now. I can't really move it to the pavement either because then it's in the way of the construction trucks that drive through here. I mean, at the very least, hopefully the T-top leaks are fixed so it can survive the rain it's about to get. I guess it's back to the Celica again. Um, it's kind of funny because this car was bought for almost half the price and has had only the bare minimum amount of work put into it and it survived constant abuse for me. Anyways, that's the episode for today. There were some other things I had planned for next episode, but this is a major priority now, so hopefully I can figure out what to do. I've read some forum posts about it, and they say this is supposed to be a 10 minute job. I really wish it was. Despite ending on that low note, thanks for watching everyone. Again, huge thanks especially to my patrons, Rally, Dylan, Larry, and Matouche, plus my donation from Eric. It's really blowing my mind how many people care enough about the series and car to donate to it, but even still, it means a lot to see all the views and I love reading all the comments too. I'm glad the videos are inspiring people and helping others out. It's gotten to the point where I'm tempted to make a second channel dedicated to just being shorter individual videos on how to do each repair and mod on the car. That way by the end it creates this definitive MR2 guide with a specific video on each part. Like I just reuse the footage from the main series but edit it to be a more focused tutorial versus how this is more of a vlog of everything in random order as I go. Of course I'd keep this series going too but it'd just be more of a side thing. I just wanna see more of these cars well taken care of and I think that'd help a lot of people out. I'm a little strapped on time between work and school on top of my video stuff, but it's definitely in my head as a future plan. Again, thanks for watching. See you all next episode.